Today's video, we're going to be looking at Bilo Harivka, which is the most east Ukraine is. And I'm going to go on Google Earth here soon, but I want to show you guys the live map first. Showing you guys when it was taken. It was taken about a month ago when the entirety of the Kharkiv region was liberated by the Ukrainians. And they're holding this area right now. It's about three miles from north to south. They're facing off against Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. And let's talk about it a little bit more when I get to Google Earth. And welcome back to beautiful little Bilohrivka, the thorn in the side of the Russians' westernmost front line here in the east. And I know from, you know, in a bird's eye view, it looks completely indefensible. <laughs> it's this tiny little area. They're surrounded from Zoltrivka, they're surrounded from Lysychansk and Severodonetsk to the east, and even these plains here, and also from the north in this forest. It looks like this is about to fall, right? But the Ukrainians have held it for about a month now, and I'm going to talk about why I think they're going to continue to hold it and continue to rain hell on both of these cities. So the first thing you gotta look at, and pretty much the only thing from Bilohorivka that is defendable, is this mile-long mine. Look at this. From the 3D perspective, you can see that the Ukrainians use this as a mine. They would dig up this ore, whatever was here, and put the access here. The nice thing about a mine is that it is diggable. I mean, it's not, there's no roots, there's no trees, there's nothing to cut down. You just dig straight in there with a shovel and you can make a trench pretty quick. So I can guarantee you, OPSEC, not even a concern, it's kind of obvious. The Ukrainians probably have about 200 soldiers dug in here, just looking at all the different flanks. The nice thing about this position as well is that it's about 100 meters tall, and that gives them the opportunity to look north in the, into that forest, look east, almost to Lysychansk, six, six miles away, which is crazy to think about, and south. You know, the Russians are the closest from the southern flank, and they are not going to be able to cross into here. I mean... The Ukrainians just have to shoot down on them. I guarantee you that the Ukrainians have anti-tank guided missiles and mortars and everything here. And if we talk about the eastern flank, which is the you know the scariest one, you got these two giant logistics hubs. And let's talk about why they're logistics hubs. I mean, this was taken three months ago, this chance and severed the by the Russians. And the thing about Ukraine is 90% of it is open fields. All right, you're not going to hide a thousand people in here. They're just going to get bombed. You're going to hide them in the cities and that's what ukraine and russia both do they hide them in the cities because it's the most defendable position but the cool thing about this is that it's about six miles away i already did the measurement to lysychansk center the cool thing about the mortar system is it is cheap and it has the range of being able to hit targets with high explosive packages into lysychansk so it's got a similar payload to you know some heavier artillery systems that are probably here in Seversk to the west. The Ukraine is probably firing on Lysychansk, but you can also get mortar systems attacking Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. So it's just a beautiful thing for mortars. Um, I'm sure that those guys are doing you know gun missions every like on the minute. And also for the defenders of uh, Bilohorivka, I uh, I salute you guys. You guys are probably getting bombed to shit right now. But luckily, I, I think this is as defendable as it gets. Other thing about the eastern flank is that this castle have an eyes view on you if you're ever going to be making a move with tanks and stuff. So the Russians really can't push in from here. And if they do, if they try and do some sort of thunder run and you know cross in here, and we're going to get some tanks up there. You're not getting tanks up this bitch, <laughs> I can guarantee you. And uh, there's definitely going to be some javelins and stuff watching them as they peak, you know, this uh, this little hill here. And the other thing about this area uh, in general, I mean, including these two cities, is this is the entire situation that Kherson is in. Uh, there's about, you know, there's this bridge, this bridge, and this bridge. And that's the only three ways that the Russians can move tanks and supplies across. You think that's not being targeted by mortars on the second from this uh, from this position? <laughs> I mean, it's it's not looking good for the Russians. You know, I bet these bridges are pocketed with mortar holes, and yeah, I mean they're they're wasting a lot of supplies, and it's a it's a big thorn. I mean, this is I wasn't kidding when I said this is a thorn. They have mortar fire raining down on, on these cities. Now uh, let's look to the north. The north is the river, and river crossings are fascinating. They're very very difficult, and the Ukrainians already have a. Uh, <laughs> you know, an upper hand here, literally. Let's talk about the river. If the Russians wanted to push in, they can't push in with tanks because it's a forest here. You can't push in. The other thing is if they if they try and get infantry across, they have to do three river crossings. Cross through here, cross through here, and then through here. All right? And uh, if you do it in any large amount, you know, a large amount to go and actually take on this position in close quarters combat, you'd have to get a company 
of soldiers, 150 people, which would get bombed the second they get seen from a drone or an LPOP position, listening post, observation post of Ukrainians looking down on here. You know, I, I guess I guess the only way that the Russians could attack from the north is with like a Spetsnaz team, like harassing, you know, in this area. And that's just not possible. The Ukrainians are going to be looking down on them. And even if, even if they aren't, somehow it's nighttime and they're able to cross. River crossings are really difficult. This same river, our team used to have to cross. The thing about rivers is, uh, this one specific, is it's fast flowing, goes to the west, or it goes to the east, it flows to the east, and it's 50 meters in width. The only way to cross this thing is with a rope, and that's how you do river crossings, uh, quietly. So you tie yourself up with a rope, you take up all your gear, you go completely butt naked because you don't want to drown, and without a weapon or anything, you swim across. But there is a current, so you're going to end up way over here. Now you're in the Ukrainian-held area, Bilohrivka, walking past Ukrainians that are hit up in these forests, and you have to walk 100 meters back up here, tie a rope around a tree, make it taut, so that your entire squad can get all their supplies and your supplies and your weapons across this river, which is going to create a lot of commotion, it's going to take a lot of time, and it's just incredibly dangerous. It's going to be a waste of human lives if they ever try and do that. So this is not an option for the Russians. This entire northern flank means nothing to the Ukrainians. Uh, so yeah, we talked about the east, we talked about the north, this is all suicide for the Russians. And let's talk about the South, which is pretty much the only thing that the Russians could do. They already have this almost surrounded. I mean, the only place that Bilohrivka has is to the West. Obviously this, you know, having just this tiny little strait from Seversk, which is where the Ukrainians have, you know, most of their supplies probably, and they transfer over to Bilohrivka. Um, so this is probably getting bombs, you know, like crazy whenever they try and do any transfers of gear. The Russians really don't want to just bomb logistics. They want to surround this and take this area over so they can get the mortar fire off of Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. So, the south. If the Russians try and move in through this valley, I was looking at this earlier, and you guys could see from the Ukrainians' perspective up there, it's suicide. They can't do it. The only possible way that the Russians can move in on Bilohrivka is to dodge it. They want to surround it. And they need to move in from Zoltrivka and this larger hub here, which is a factory. And they need to move more west and then cross in to this forest, right? The problem with that is if they were to move in any more west, they're going to be within probably about 20, maybe 50 tanks of Ukrainians that are in Seversk within direct fire of Seversk. When it comes to uh, attacking units, going up against defense units, I'm sure all of you know, it has to be three to one. You think you can get three to one? getting, you know, all the way over here and then crossing, I, I don't think so. This is going to be a big movement through open fields trying to get across and, you know, the three miles looks small, but it's it's a large area. There's definitely Ukrainians, second and third lines of defense for Bilohrivka just waiting here for you. So they can't surround. They're going to get hit from both sides and just get into a whole mess. So Bilohrivka is here to stay. I am calling it right now. It is getting some fire on Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. It is uh, way out to the east, and it is a very similar situation to Kherson, which I'm probably going to do in the next lineup of this series. Hope you guys enjoyed. I was rambling quite a bit, but hope you learned something. And hope you got a you know better understanding of the front line here in Ukraine. Thanks for listening. Peace.